Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode, and I'm very excited for this one. We're talking about leading with grit and grace, and it's about a journey of organizational culture change. And to have us walk through this, this conversation, we have the author of Leading with Grit and Grace, and also the president of Onyx, Miss Ashley Walters. Hey, Ashley, how are you? Great. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. Oh, I'm so excited. And when we met for the first time, I, I just it was an instant connection. I loved your story, and you told me that, about your book, and I think I ordered it while we were talking together, actually. <laughs> and it came in, and, and and my wife said, "Your book's here." And um, I, I remember just sitting down, and I just couldn't stop. Is basically read it from from cover to cover. Thought it was such an amazing story, and, and loved all the areas that you covered so very excited for our listeners here and maybe get us started to talking about the why you know it is eco ask why so we usually end with the why but maybe start us off with the why just like you did in the book you know why is, is getting your why defined so important to get that journey started correctly it is. Um, I will tell you, it took us a little while to get that why defined. So uh, as you read the book, yes, it's the first step and it is a very important one, but don't worry if, if you don't get it right just out of the gate. It took us about seven years. And uh, what happened with the company is we lost our why. We lost our family centric values and, and it took us a little while to come back to that. So in the book, I tell you, you know, we wrote that first why. It was about quality and safety and those are things that we're supposed to do as manufacturers. That's not our why. Uh, so we came to make things better, empowered employees, happy clients, and thriving communities. And that is what that why gives us our energy. And when things are going a little sideways on us, or you know, the world team seems a little topsy turvy, we go back to that why and and find our passion and are able to move forward. For sure, for sure. Now, and for the listeners who may not know. Ashley, what about Onyx? What, what do you guys do there? So Onyx has been in business for over 50 years now uh, here in Erie, Pennsylvania, and we service and build industrial furnaces. So think about all your forge and heat treat, um, a lot of defense and aerospace type work. Right, right. All right. Good stuff. So you, once you had that why defined, and it sounded like it took you guys to get aligned on that, and it, no, no surprise there. Yeah. Then you have to start embracing change, right? So, how do right. what 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 suggestions or or advice would you have there? So, I think, you know, when you think about change, a lot of people say there's a fear of change or uh, change is hard, mm -hmm. but change doesn't have to be hard. It can be fun too. If you think of it as a growing experience, it becomes a whole lot more fun. You're you know you're checking off things on the on the list of uh, on your journey. And uh, just remember to celebrate all those successes along the way. That makes that change even more fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, typically, I don't think of fun when I think of change. So that's <laughs> <You're right. laughs> that's a good way to put it. You know, I had I would have, thinking back to my old shop days when I, whenever I tried to sh change something on the shop floor, um, I was usually you know having to wash my back when I went to the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. So I mean, when when change doesn't. You know, sometimes it, it, it always doesn't end with the, the outcome that you desire. What advice yeah. or would you have for those people out there who are maybe in a le leadership role to kind of build that culture where it's okay to, to fail, you know, and, and empowering your people? So any thoughts there on what you guys did? Yeah, so one of the most popular chapters in the book is called Freedom to Fail. And um, it was also a very popular blog post when I posted originally on LinkedIn and um, went on to expand the idea in the book. But, you know, when you think of failure, sometimes people think of risk. You know, we're, we're making industrial furnaces here. I'm not allowing my people to fail in making an industrial furnace. What we're talking about is problem solving. So we are choosing a, a journey, a path, and we're trying to tackle a problem. And in that we experiment with ways that we think that we can get better and those experiments aren't always successful. But with each iteration, we are learning from the experiment. So we're writing down what the outcome we expect to be and then what the actual outcome was and talking about why we didn't achieve the expected outcome and then trying again 
So, you know, we are failing and we're failing fast and trying to be innovative uh, in all that we're doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so who's involved in all that, you know, so far as empowering them and, and solving their problems? Is that everybody who works, you know, at the company? So I always say continuous improvement and problem solving goes from the CEO to the plant floor. It's on all of us every day to make things better, to improve what we're doing. And with that greater mission in mind that we're improving ourselves so that we can be better for our clients. But we're also, most of what we do is in a plant and a client site. And so I also ask our personnel, if you're fixing the same problem over and over for a client, let's talk about how we can make it better for them too. Because we feel it's very important to have manufacturing in our small town USAs, right? So we want to make sure they're, that we're making them better too. Sure. And it sounds like you've kind of built a culture where I love how you say it's okay to fail, but it's it's embracing that experimentation where that is kind of expected. I'm, it sounds like it's expected somewhat of the employees to, to experiment and to try things to get better. Yes, absolutely. It, it's an expectation to be continuously improving. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I mean, did it take, how long did it take to really start getting some buy-in on that? To, hey, this is really good. I'm not going to get in trouble if I, if I, if I step out here. So it took a little while to get buy-in. We had a CFO that had managed the company, very command and control, uh, had siloed everybody, would berate people in front of others. So when I came in as general manager, you can imagine that, um, people didn't trust me. They didn't know how I was gonna react. And they had been um, beaten by the previous CFO, right? They were a little downtrodden. So what I did was I just went and I started asking curious questions. So I went to the people closest to the work and I said, what frustrates you? What takes up the most time? What tasks do you just wish would go away? And they would tell me and I would say, okay, let's get rid of it. Let's figure it out. Let's solve it. And so as we started solving problems together, that's how I built trust and rapport with the team. Okay. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's wonderful. So just start basic with the asking questions. And I guess the fact that they recognize that you're asking, but you're actually listening first of all, to, to what they're saying. And then you're, you're taking action based off of those questions. I'm, I'm sure that did build some, some trust pretty quickly. And, I, and you nailed it exactly right, Chris. You have to take action and you have to take action quickly. Uh, otherwise, they won't continue to give you ideas and help you solve the problems. Um, in one instance, so we do a lot in aerospace. And so one of the ideas that had come to me was um, to change a process. And we can't change anything about how we do anything in aerospace. So, you know, my response was, thank you so much for that idea. Here's why we can't make that change. But keep thinking, Mm -hmm. you know, so make sure you respond, whether you can make the change or not. Or, you know, if it's a capital expenditure and it's going to take a little longer to get approval, just continue to communicate that you're working through that process. Right, right. I love it. Great stuff. Thank you so much. And, you know, for, for the listeners out there, the, the book, we'll have the link there because I'm walking right through the book with Ashley. And the chapter that got me was the servant leadership. I, I, I love, you know, that's that's for me personally, uh, that's something I really try to, to live out every day uh, and, and serve others. And so when I saw that in Grit and Grace, I was like, whew, this is going to be the one for me right here. So maybe explain to those listeners out there what your definition of servant leadership is. And, and I really liked how you referenced how you could see that style in others. Uh, so any, any thoughts there? Yeah, so to me, servant leadership just means meeting people where they are. Um, you know, your job as a leader is to help people grow. Think of yourself as a coach. Great teams have good coaches. And your job as a leader is to to help somebody in removing obstacles for them and making sure that they're playing to their strengths. So I use the example in the book of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I have the teams write instructions on, on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And you would think this is a really easy task, right? Like how hard can it possibly be? But then I take those directions very literally. And I want to 
let everybody know that people are coming from a different history and a different perspective. And so Chris, where you might put peanut butter on the right hand side and I and jelly on the left, maybe I put peanut butter and jelly on the same piece of bread, right? So this starts out the conversation. Well, they learn pretty quickly when I'm taking the jar of peanut butter and setting it on top of the bag of bread that they're gonna have to be more specific with their instructions. And it's really hard to write job instructions. So sometimes it's just easier to meet the person where they are and to work right alongside them. For sure. I mean, that, that analogy, I, it, it definitely stood out. So any when you're doing that with, 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 I guess, maybe new employees, is that an eye-opening moment for them? I did it with my production floor manager. And at first he said I was a jerk. And then, and then he's like, I get it, though. He said, I, I can't just tell them. I said, when the outcome isn't what you were expecting, you need to really think about what it is you said to them because their history and perspective makes them hear it differently than how you are saying it. Ah. So and I, go show them. That takes the confusion out of it for everybody. Right. And, but I guess to meet them where they are, that kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about asking questions. You really can't know where someone is if you don't have that culture and that acceptance to be inquisitive and to, to really know where they are. You, Cause you, a lot of problems do happen when you make those assumptions, I'm assuming. Right? Yeah, you can, right? You can, you can think you know where someone is too, right? That's but right. if you don't go and ask the questions and listen to the answers, um, then you aren't going to be meeting them where they are. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And on the servant leadership, you were talking about coaching. And, and that was a big theme that I caught you know, throughout the book of, of coaching. And I love that, that mentality of coaching others and helping them to, to grow. So any suggestion for leaders out there and maybe listen, Ashley, on, on how they can start creating that, that personal coaching approach in their own styles? Yeah, so back to manufacturing and our history with a command and control leadership style. My thought on this is nobody likes to be told what to do. Right. And, and, and if you're telling them what to do, they're only going to do what they're told to do. They're not going to think outside the box. So with the coach approach, you're really setting it up and you're telling somebody, OK, this is where I see us going in the future and allowing them the opportunity to figure out their own roadmap to get there. And it's so much more fulfilling to get to the goal by your own way than to be told every step to take. And the coach is there, you know, as a guide along the way. Once again, we're helping remove obstacles. We're um, helping somebody see their blind spots. But we're doing it with a front, like looking out the front mirror. We're not looking in the rear view like we do with annual reviews. So um, I share in the book that I had a very poor annual review. And I'm an overachiever. Like I want to be the best at everything I'm doing, right? And that review set really poorly with me because I'd been told to write a manufacturing plan, but what I'd really done was identify the problem and move the entire manufacturing operation, but I hadn't written a plan. So I got the end result done, but I didn't take the path that I was told to take. And that's when I decided an annual review process wasn't right for us. We were so agile and we have to move so quickly that I didn't want to be looking in the rear view mirror. Right. So, so who are the coaches? Is it across the board? So we have, you know, the leadership team mm-hmm. are our coaches, um, but we also have peer coaches. So when somebody's working, we do a lot of like cross collaboration. Um, we found pretty early on in the journey that if we weren't asking the people in front of us on the task and the people behind us on the task, uh, that we would get things really messed up really quickly. So we do a lot of cross collaboration as well. Okay. Now, is that do you do you coach the coaches for say do they do they go to training for this to 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 learn some coaching styles and techniques? We did. We started out twenty twenty um, with a coaching class, just setting the stage for this new approach because it was twenty nineteen when I decided we were no longer going to do the annual reviews. Um, so twenty twenty, as you can imagine, got off to a little rougher start than yeah. than we had expected. But we did set the stage with the coach approach, and then um, we're able to continue our journey um, in June. 
of 2020 with additional training. Um, while we, it's not an incredibly formal process here, we're not documenting every time we meet with somebody, but we're making sure we have those conversations in those coachable moments. So I don't think you can say, well, Tuesday at 1030 is going to be a coachable moment, right? right, right that's right. <laughs> Well, it sounds um, like, though, you're being intentional about really trying to, to build them up to think differently, to, to act differently as a coach, and that ultimately is going to make such a, a huge impact on, the, on your business. Yeah, we're pointing out, like, when things are going astray, but we're also talking about when things are going really well and, and noticing the changes that are being made. Right, right. Well, I mean, hats off to you. I, I loved it. I thought the coaching was wonderful. And, you know, as I moved through the book, you were talking also about sometimes even, I guess even when you're coach, there is an alignment with, with people. And sometimes there's not alignment with your overall mission statement. So, you know, you talked about identifying key objectives and KPIs to really align to the mission. So any advice out there for businesses moving forward to try to get those metrics right or evaluate, hey, that we're, we're chasing the right stuff, that our people know what's important and how they're impacting that? So my advice on KPIs is don't dig too deep. Don't get too granular with KPIs because you'll find what you are measuring gets moved around, right? That's how, how people win a game. So we keep it very high level. Uh, you know, we're looking at financials and quality and on-time delivery and safety, kind of the, the very top of the KPI funnel, let's call it. But what I do do that is probably different is I choose one wildly important goal for the organization for the year. And when I say I choose, it's not just me choosing. It's, it's what we need to focus on as the organization. What's most important? And I talk about how, you know, we always talk about our priorities well, priority was only meant to be singular. You may only have one priority. And so that's what we call our wildly important goal. And then what I ask is each leader for their department chooses the battle that they're going to fight to help us win the war, to help us get to that goal. And then they ask their personnel to, to choose their battle. And that's how we cascade a goal through the organization. It's not me as the leader choosing the goal for every single person through the organization. It's the ones closest to the work that are choosing their goal that they know that they can achieve. And then they hold themselves accountable for it. It was their goal, not mine. Right? Right. Now, do they typically align up? Because you, you mentioned cascading goals, and I love it. So do, the, do their goals align up to your, your wildly important goal? Is that typically they what do. you say? Okay. Yeah, they definitely do. So we, you know, this year, because we're an employee-owned company, our goal was to increase our earnings per share. That's important to them now that they're an owner, right? And so we have had a lot of education around how do you affect the earnings per share. What can you do to help minimize costs or increase sales or whatever it is in your department, in your world that you can do? So for instance, our draftsman, he, his KPI, his um, battle that he was going to fight was that he was going to make assemblies for different parts of the furnace. And that way he could plug in an assembly and not have to draw each component each time. And so he's made an assembly library. Um, but I would have never have known to tell him to do that. Right. I don't draft, so I wouldn't have known that that was a thing. <laughs> well, it's so great to, okay, and I think that's so so many times when I've talked to business leaders that that's the missing link is having the tie that from the floor standpoint back to what impact am I making on the actual company important goal? For your instance, the the wig is, is I believe what you referred to it as. So the fact that you guys are being intentional about that and really giving that, that map. Now, do they see that? Is there, is there a visual or something like that? So do they know, hey, this is the wildly important goal and here's my tie to it? Is, it, is there any, any visual tie there? Yeah, so we meet as a team um, on a quarterly basis and we talk about where we are tracking against our goal. And so they're reporting out to their peers on how they're doing against the goal that they chose. So right back to accountability, right? Um, especially as employee owners, you want to make sure everybody on the team's playing and doing their best. And, and then it also serves as education for the other 
peers because they don't always know what somebody else's job is or what it entails. And so they really get to learn the whole business by hearing their peers report out on how they're tracking against their goals. I think that's such an important piece and it's, it's, it's not overlooked, but it's just undervalued when, when you're in an organization and you know your tie to the, to what's important for the company, but you also know everyone around you that just creates yeah. this unity in the culture. And so if they're reaching out, I'm imagining if they're reaching out to another department that they typically wouldn't work with, they're not going in completely cold. They know what some of that department, for instance, is, is trying to accomplish to get the overall wildly important goal achieved. Yes. Perfect. This has been fun. I'm loving it. So I'm going to shift us real quick on a topic that I love. I've learned a lot over since starting the podcast, and it's around marketing. And it's, mm-hmm. I just think it's fascinating that, that when you went there within the book, you talked about the value proposition and the customer voice, and that yeah. this is some areas that, that you've seen businesses miss. So curious, how do you connect those two? You know, and, and, and do you have uh, influence on one versus the other more as a leader, or are they both equally as important? Just just your thoughts here. Yeah, so I, I think that customer voice is very important. And I think the value proposition has to be created from what the customer voice is. So customers, their needs change over time. I mean, we think we're agile and, and innovative, right? But if we're not innovating to what they need, uh, what's the point? And if we're not serving them, then they will leave. So I think it's very important to have these conversations with the client and even try to be ahead of them, assessing what they might need ahead of time Mm -hmm. Um, or identifying some areas that, that, you know, we're in our case, we're always repairing or they're always struggling with a furnace survey or something. How can we help them be better? So is that so I'm, I guess I'm hearing when you hear that piece is so is that modifying your value prop at that point once you get that feedback? So I think you know our value proposition has remained pretty uh, much the same over 50 years, but we're always tweaking it to meet that client need. Gotcha. For that ever-changing marketplace, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. For sure. For sure. Well, Ashley, this has been wonderful, and, and again, we, we call it Eco S Y. So we, we usually wrap up with the why. I know we started with with your why at the very beginning, but we want to want to wrap up with the why too. So for our listeners out there who are interested in and in, in they they want to know more, why should leaders embrace this organizational culture change? And I love the way you put it, with grit and grace, uh, to build yeah. those great businesses of, of the future. Yeah. So for me, the why is manufacturing has been known as command and control since the industrial revolution and the leaders have been tasked with thinking of every possible task for everyone in the in the company but for me that doesn't feel good it feels better to have people uh create their own success and play to their own strengths so i think we need to turn this around and take a coach approach the other important part of this is you know there's not a huge workforce we don't have a growing population right now and manufacturers are gonna have to compete with other industries for personnel. And you need to think about why somebody would come to work for you and in your company and and do the things that are important to you. So for me, it's all about grit, you know, determination, resilience, and persistence, but then leading with grace as well, that empathy and compassion piece that historically we may have missed on as manufacturers. For sure. Great stuff. I, I love it. It's been a wonderful conversation. Now, for our listeners that want to connect with you, Ashley, or learn more, where's the best place that they can find you? So LinkedIn is a great place to find me and start the conversation. And of course, you can find the book on Amazon. Yep. And we will have, as usual, listeners, in the show notes, you, you'll have the link to Ashley's LinkedIn profile, as well as a direct link to Amazon to, to get the book. Uh, send her a note, let her know where it's printed at. We're, we're, she's building up a, a, a big following. Hopefully we'll have books and printed in all 50 states here before too long. But Ashley, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, for what you shared with the listeners. It's been a fun conversation and really just appreciative of your time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Chris. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. 
This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.